Greetings, everyone. Welcome to chapter 16 in uh, of Living with Art, the Renaissance. So first of all, I want you to notice the different tone in this chapter. All of a sudden, we seem to have a lot of information about the artists, anecdotes, little stories about them. Um, and I'm wondering if this is just because we're getting closer to our own time. We're talking about a period, you know, 600 or so years before our own time. And uh, so is this a matter of just having a lot of historical records laying around or does this show a kind of shift in how artists were seen? Remember, um, the difference between art and craft began to be um, explained uh, during the Renaissance uh, before it was all considered techne, which was, a, you know, art and craft weren't seen as two different things. So the role of artists appears to have shifted during the Renaissance. Um, but, you know, this painting here, Giorgione's The Tempest, is an interesting exception because we don't know much about it. Uh, apparently his contemporaries didn't even know what the imagery was supposed to mean. Um, the video that follows this PowerPoint, or the, the link is at the very end of the PowerPoint um, of Kenneth Clark's uh, Civilization, Man, the Measure of All Things is the name of the episode. He talks about this image, so I'll leave that to him. Um, so we have a plethora of images in the Renaissance, yet uh, we also have a kind of uh, blowback that this chapter doesn't talk about, or just vaguely uh, uh, sort of just touches on a little bit, and that's um, the iconoclasm that started with Protestantism in the uh, 16th century, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. And it, but as I say, it, it doesn't—it's not a major theme in this chapter. So, moving on to the next image here. This is just an overview of the chapter. We have the early Renaissance, the high Renaissance, and the northern Renaissance. Uh, these, obviously the early Renaissance began in Italy around 1400 or so. The high Renaissance ended, uh, so it's said, around 1520. But at the same time, um, and, and with, a, with something of a delay from the Italian Renaissance, the Renaissance did hit countries in the north a little later on. So we have the period from about 1400 to 1600, and Renaissance means rebirth. It's interesting that we typically use the French word for it. The Italian is uh, risorgimento, if I'm saying that right. Um, also rebirth. Um, it's interesting that they were aware at the time of this sense of rebirth or of something new occurring. Um, and this rebirth refers to the revival of interest in ancient Greek and Roman culture, of course. Um, but a lot of other things were going on, and I think the Cl Kenneth Clark video will explain that, this new sense of what mankind, of what humankind could do. Another important aspect is the role of the uh, rich merchant class, like the Medicis in Florence, who joined the nobility and clergy as art patrons. And the important thing to keep in mind here is we are talking about, yes, money. Even though the US dollar did not exist at the time, it was really money, um, not to be cynical, but you know, it took money to pay for all this art. Here's a broad overview of Europe at the time. Um, this is the beginning of nation states too. The Holy Roman Empire was kind of a loose agglomeration it, it, in the north of these, um, uh, city-states, duchies, little principalities and things like that. But in France, you do have a more unified, centralized government as you do in England starting at this time. Uh, bear that in mind, whereas Italy was uh, an agglomeration of different countries, basically, and Italy was not unified until um, the 19th century. And, and same, same goes for Germany, too. But it was the beginning of the nation state. So, you know, as I mentioned before, the role of the artist was changing. Uh, they were no longer looked down upon as mere craftsmen, right? They were considered something special. And also painting, sculpture, and architecture was, were held as intellectual, intellectual activities allied with mathematics, science, and poetry. So you have an elevation of painting 
and uh, particular sculpture, which had been looked down upon more than painting. Uh, sculpture was considered a kind of craft, you know, it was just labor intensive and kind of dirty. And it was elevated to this new status along with um, the other fine arts like uh, painting. So one of the big influences was the rediscovery of the work of Plato. And Plato is famous for uh, promulgating this idea that the good and the beautiful were more or less one and the same, that whatever was good was beautiful and whatever, beautif whatever was beautiful was good. And as Kenneth Clark will ta uh, talk about, humankind was viewed as God's finest and most perfect creation during the Renaissance. Uh, this was not the view held in the Gothic period or the medieval period. And then reason and creativity were considered God's gifts. So if, if you could exercise reason and creativity, then you were uh, pleasing God. So here's Donatello's David. Uh, Interestingly, we don't have a lot of information about when this particular bronze was cast. There's some, uh, we know about Donatello, but we don't know the specifics of this. The bronze could have been cast long after the original was made in plaster or clay. Kenneth Clark will discuss this one a little more too, but uh, bear in mind that this is considered the first freestanding nude male sculpture since antiquity. That is, since the time of the Greeks and Romans. You had a period of about, oh, uh, 1300 years where nude male sculptures were not made in the West. Here's an overview of what we might want to call Renaissance practices. Artists work to reproduce the natural world as accurately as they could. They studied the natural effects of light and developed the technique of chiaroscuro, which just means light and dark in Italian. Um, and then noticing that distant objects appear smaller than ones that are close to us, they developed the system of linear perspective, which we'll talk about a little bit. This is vanishing point perspective, which we, I guess we did see that already in uh, chapter four. Uh, and then seeing how detail and color blurred with distance, they developed the principle of atmospheric perspective. Just think when, for instance, last summer when it was so smoky, uh, things that were far away appeared bluer and paler than things that were up close. That's an example of atmospheric pers perspective, although a very extreme one. Artists also studied anatomy, anatomy even dissecting cadavers to fully, fully understand the human form. So the early Renaissance is characterized by the work of artists like Donatello, who we just saw, Ghiberti, Masaccio, Masaccio, and Botticelli. And Donatello was a sculptor and used the body as the framework onto which the fabric was draped, not as we saw in the medieval period or the, even the late Gothic, where the sculptures of the human form that were you know, invariably clothed, uh, they looked quite stiff and uh, rigid, not like real bodies. So what uh, Donatello did was to sculpt full-size full clay models of nude figures and then draped clay-soaked linen over the clay models to create those garments. Then this model was copied in marble or in bronze, as the case may be. So here's Donatello's St. Mark. Uh, from 1411 to 1413. Uh, this one is marble, I believe. But notice how natural the pose is and how the joints are articulated. So there was this sense of the body underneath the fabric, this living, breathing form underneath the fabric. Next, we move on to Masaccio. He was a painter and used linear perspective and created these deep architectural, illusionistic architectural spaces in his work. Um, and then we'll, we'll see one of his images next. And then after that, we have Ghiberti's baptistry doors, and he also used vanishing point perspective. And, and you'll notice the interesting use or the naturalistic use of architecture in his work. So here's Masaccio's Trinity with Virgin, St. John, the Evangelist, and donors from 1425. Um, this apparently was covered up for some time, but its existence was eventually um, established and they removed the, the, I think it was, there was 
plaster over it. They had painted something else over it. Sort of an irony that this is an icon of art history now, but was lost for some time. Notice that the vanishing point um, is right at the foot of the uh, Christ's feet, apparently. I mean, it depends how you draw the lines, but you have the barrel vaulted ceiling, the coffered barrel vaulted ceiling painted behind Christ, and the lines lead down to the foot of the cross. Next, we have Gilberti's the story of Jacob and Esau. Um, we will also see this in the uh, Kenneth Clark video that follows. Um, notice the use of the architecture. It is in proportion to the figures. Remember from last week, Duccio and, uh, well, particularly Duccio, but perhaps also uh, Giotto. Their, the architecture that they used in their paintings looked more like stage sets. It wasn't quite in scale necessarily. And Giberti used the architecture as a uh, kind of an enveloping space, but also as a backdrop for the action. Uh, and in, in a very subtle, but I think effective way, really beautiful work. So the early Renaissance continuing here, Botticelli was a painter who worked for the Medici family uh, off and on, and they were the Medicis were famous for commissioning secular artwork, not always secular, but uh, that is non-religious artwork. And the Medicis were this rich merchant class family. Um, also, they were art patrons. They sponsored an academy, which was a discussion group, basically, where humanist scholars met to discuss classical culture and its relationship to Christianity. This combined system of thought, according to our book, was known as Neoplatonism. You might just call them Platonists. Neoplatonism typically refers to a period around 100 in the common area with a philosopher named Plotinus. So this might be a little inaccurate, but what is accurate is that Renaissance scholars were greatly influenced by the work of Plato, which had just been recently, um, well, it was known, but recently widely available. That's probably the best way to put it, recently available to them. So here's Botticelli's Birth of Venus. And according to our book, this shows the platonic influence. Um, this is less, the space is less naturalistic than we see in a lot of Renaissance painting, uh, sort of uh, stage setting like. This painting is a certain sort of flatness that apparently the Medici's really liked. And um, the neo, the quote, neoplatonist scholars, unquote, would have associated Venus with Eve and the Virgin Mary, for instance, uh, from um, the Old and New Testament. So there is this link between Christianity and Platonic thought. So now we reach the High Renaissance. The key players, well, there were a number of key players, but of course we have Leonardo and Michelangelo, and then Raphael is the other one of these uh, important artists, Titian and Giorgione, yeah, also quite important. But in a sense, I, from my, my own personal feeling, it's really Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael that make up the, the kind of core of the high Renaissance. So here's Leonardo's study of human proportions, according to Vitruvius. Uh, you know, this was based on his, you know, various in-depth researches into a lot of different fields. So this interest in the human body was carried uh, to, you know, a wonderful extent by his contemporary, his younger contemporary, Michelangelo, and this is the famous David from 1501 to 04. Uh, it's now indoors. It once stood outside for a long time, but it was being uh, it's marble, which is easily dissolved by industrial pollution. And he's about 18 feet tall. On uh, and I'm not sure whether that includes the pedestal or not. When you see it in person, um, it's a little different than this because the photograph. His head is probably disproportionately a little large, but part of the reason is that you'd be seeing it from below. This makes it seem like you're you're sort of at knee level or something like that. But when you see it in person, it's up on a tall pedestal that's probably 
six feet tall. Uh, so it's a little bit different experience in person. But notice the tension in the form, and I don't have a good image here of the face, but this is not a mere copy of a classical original from Greek or Roman sculpture. This is a new formulation of idealized male beauty in the Renaissance. Uh, the other thing I'd mention is that David seems to be thinking about something well, he is definitely thinking about something, right? After slaying Goliath, in a way that Greek sculptures didn't, they didn't convey, convey the same kind of intellectual or emotional uh, processes that were going on inside the, you know, the subject's head. And the Renaissance really brought that to the fore. Here is a, a work of Michelangelo's that's slightly earlier, the Pietà that's in the Vatican from 1498 to 1500, um, a very tender kind of, well, but maybe also disturbing um, image of the Virgin Mary cradling the dead Jesus. Notice how Michelangelo has used the draping around her, uh, her garment to support the dead Christ in a way that would be awkward without that because it would be hard for a, uh, a, a woman to support a grown man on her lap like that. But he's sort of overcome that um, visual problem through some, some tricks of the trade. So also in the high Renaissance, we have Leonardo da Vinci, the quintessential Renaissance man, right? Painter, inventor, sculptor, architect, engineer, scientist, scientist and musician. Um, he left many works uncompleted. And the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper are his most famous works. Um, one of the, his techniques or stylistic um, hallmarks is what's called sfumato. It's Italian for smoke, or it derives from the word, the Italian word for smoke. Um, it's a layering of translucent glazes produced that produce hazy, a hazy atmosphere, softened colors, and velvety shadows. The image we have for this is not perhaps um, the best example of Sovomato. It does have some, uh, the Mona Lisa might be a better example, the way it seems a little smokier and darker. This is post-restoration, so it is possible that some of the layers of glaze could have been inadvertently removed along with the grime. It seems a little luminous. Um, to be this pure sfumato style, but you do notice that it, it does have some of the characteristics. It's also an example of chiaroscuro, where you have these variations in light and dark that make the painting look more three-dimensional. And next, uh, we return to Michelangelo, uh, 25 years younger than Leonardo, but his greatest rival. He was a painter, sculptor, poet, architect, but apparently not a musician. Uh, he mainly saw himself as a sculptor, although he ended up making a lot of paintings. So the tension and energy that we saw in the David a uh, sculpture of his are a hallmark of Renaissance sculpture in general. Uh, the Sistine Chapel is one of his most famous works. It's a fresco series on a ceiling and depicts stories, prophets, and sibyls from the Bible's Old Testament. The sibyls might be considered to be more from uh, Greek mythology. There are, are uh, fortune tellers or women who can foresee the future. He was also the architect of the new St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. We'll see image of these images of these momentarily. So here's the Sistine Chapel. Um, you can pause this if you need to, if you want to see how, how the images are um, ordered on this. Think of how this is somewhat similar to the way a comic book is laid out. You don't necessarily read it from right to left, but it is a uh, an example of that usage of space. Also note that some of these architectural details are painted on and it's hard to tell which ones are painted on and which ones are actually part of the ceiling. Here's a broad view looking toward the last judgment which we've got a, a sort of a close-up of here. Here's the last judgment painted after the bulk of the ceiling by Michelangelo also. And then we have his St. Peter, Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. 
This photograph doesn't give an idea of how huge the interior is, but uh, seeing it in person, you realize how they must have felt at this point in the Renaissance that they had really returned to the achievements of the ancient Romans. Um, and remember, the Roman ruins were all around them, particularly in Rome, um, but all over Italy and southern France. So they, people in the Renaissance, or prior to the Renaissance, were aware that there was this glorious uh, civilization that preceded them. This wasn't so much the case in the north where they had fewer examples of Roman architecture. So in a sense, the Northern Renaissance is less influenced by Greek and Roman culture um, and more evolved out of the Middle Ages, this medieval culture with the influence from the Italian Renaissance. Um, the Limburg brothers, von Eyck, Gunewald, Hans Holbein, the Younger, and Dürer are just a few of the artists associated with this period. We'll see some of their images. There are more in the book. Um, and in the North, artists were interested in details. Uh, there was a long tradition of decorative arts, miniatures, manuscript, illumination, stained glass, and tapestries. They were interested in the precise outer appearance of their subjects, and the religious artwork tended to be emotionally sort of disturbing, like Christ on the cross. Again, there's an image of that in the book. Here we have the Limburg Brothers' February from Les Très Riches de Duc de Berry from 1416. Notice the kind of awkward use of the space, uh, the, uh, the, the depiction of the interior space in the little house and how everything's sort of out of proportion. But it does show an attention to detail and it gives you a, kind of, a sense of the atmosphere of the time um, and the time of year. And that's why it's most significant. And here we have Robert Campen's Marode altarpiece. Notice the, uh, again, the spatial incongruities. The table in the center panel is tipped up a little too much. Um, it's not elliptical the way it would be in reality from this angle probably, but notice the attention to detail. So you have this sort of awkwardness of the space, but it's it's effectively illusionistic, right? It looks like it's it's deep, it's just not, doesn't follow the Italian Renaissance linear perspective mode, but an intense, an intent attention to detail that characterizes the Northern Renaissance and these jewel-like colors. Here we have a, one of the most famous paintings in art history, uh, Hol Hans Holbein the Younger's double portrait of Jean de Danville and Georges de Selve, otherwise known as the Ambassadors, that's the typical name. 1533, um, it's located now in London. Um, notice the strange shape running from the lower left to the sort of middle lower right. If you get at the correct angle, that's an, what they call an anamorphic projection. It makes a skull, which you can probably see from the angle, the normal angle of viewing the screen. But think of the relation of this painting to those Vanitas paintings we saw very early in the course. All these reminders of the fleeting nature of life amidst all this opulence and even, you know, even among the powerful, everybody, everyone will be laid low eventually by death. And that's, that's one of the themes of the painting. Then the late Renaissance, we're back to Italy here more or less. Um, this corresponds with the death of Raphael in 1520. He died pretty young, I think at age 37. Here's a somewhat unusual example of Raphael's work, Pope Leo X with two cardinals. Those were the nephews of the Pope. Um, you know, Raphael is more famous for paintings like the School of Athens in the Vatican or his various paintings of the Virgin Mary. Um, but here we have a more typical portrait. But one thing to note is that this period in the Renaissance, the High Renaissance, uh, the compositions tend to be quite stable. Um, there's a certain level of re uh, refinement, but not flamboyance. But with the death of Raphael, we have a period or a style, sorry, called mannerism. And this comes from the Italian maniera, meaning style or stylishness. I often wonder if maybe the word mannerism in English has a more negative connotation than the Italian version, because it seems to me that style doesn't really connote this sort of um, 
oh, uh, kind of the negativity that mannerism sound at least sounds to me. So, um, artwork uh, of mannerism grew out of the possibility suggested by uh, Michelangelo that last um, judgment painting with its sinuous forms. Uh, and it had a certain kind of flamboyance and um, undulation and sinuousness. And Bronzino typifi typifies mat the manner style with this these undulating forms, the rather, oh, a sort of exotic and erotic, right? Cupid is actually Venus's son, but he's embracing her and fondling her, her breast in a way that uh, seems strange, right, to our eyes. Uh, and this is an allegory, so it has, you, you're supposed to read the various um, images in it. So time, I believe, is the old man at the top. So it's meant to give you a glimpse into classical mythology. Here's another Mannerist work, Tintoretto's Last Supper from 1592 to 94. Um, notice the strong diagonal in the composition. Christ is in the middle, the, the figure with the brightest halo behind his head. Judas, who will betray him, is a couple of figures over in red to the right, our right, um, at the at the you know, sort of one end of the table. But there's a lot going on here. Rem think of the comparison with Leonardo's Last Supper and how stable that composition is. This one has a lot of other things. Uh, it's almost like um, TV in a way, uh, that it has so much going on all the time to attract our attention. So here are the key terms from the Renaissance chapter, oil painting, sfumato, and chiaroscuro, which are related but not identical. Sfumato is smoke, remember, smoky, and the chiaroscuro is the light and dark. Linear and atmospheric perspective, which we've covered before. Humanism is this newfound sense in the, the dignity and importance of mankind, humankind. Um, the Kenneth Clark video will talk more about this. Plato and the importance of Neoplatonism, or at least a little safer to say, just the importance of Plato's thought to the Renaissance because it became newly available to them. The art patron is basically the one who can foot the bill for the art, a very important idea. The Medicis were the rich Florentine family in and out of power during the Renaissance. The academy was a sort of salon or school that they, a uh, discussion group, I think is maybe the best way to put it, that they set up. And then mannerism is the style that follows the high Renaissance and with the notable for these sinuous forms and this kind of flamboyant visual style. So next, I would like you to watch Kenneth Clark's uh, Civilization show. It's about 50 minutes long, five zero minutes long. The, the episode is titled Man, the Measure of All Things. If this link doesn't work, um, you might cut and paste it into your browser or do a search on YouTube. Um, this was part of a BBC television series from the 1960s that launched their color television service. Um, what's interesting is that now 50 plus years, 50 or so years later, um, Italy doesn't even look the way it looks in the images. Uh, everything, it's not just a matter of the style of the clothes. I mean, these, these places have changed in the last 50 years in a way that they didn't change over the prior, uh, you know, thousand years even. So that's interesting to note. So I hope you enjoy that video. It's kind of old school in some ways, but Clark was a brilliant um, British art historian and, and really has a lot of insights that are quite personal into the art of the Renaissance. So thanks for listening and I will see you soon.